Welcome to The Weekly, a podcast brought to you by Calvary Bible Church. I'm your host, Jay Ewing. I reside on the Erie campus most often, but you can find me at calvarybible.com. I have a headshot there. So does Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Good morning. What's up, buddy? <laughs> I was like, you find me? I guess you can find me in the headshot. Man, the headshots? I don't know. I've only had a headshot because I work here at Calvary Bible Church. No doubt. We're not selling insurance, but we do have those <laughs> and shots. <laughs> hey, Calvary, so good to be with you. It's Thanksgiving week. It's Turkey week. Or in Jay Ewing's household, that's chicken week. <laughs> Ain't no turkey this year. I got confirmed by the mother-in-law. Really? Ain't no turkey. What are you guys cooking? Chicken. Oh, chicken instead of the turkey? bird. We're going to go to a different bird. What's the point? The point is, a <laughs> chicken is better than turkey. That's the point. Uh, Definitely chicken. I don't know. So than. my kids watch the Dude Perfect. Like yeah, YouTube. the Thanksgiving. Yeah, so they stereotypes. watched that yesterday, yes. and someone had like the perfect turkey that had been like seasoned, marinated, brined. <laughs> yeah, totally. You know, rested, baked. I, I know where this is. Going. And then the other dude at the table pulls out the Oscar Mayer. <laughs> like oven roasted turkey, yeah, uh, deli meat. <laughs> and as, as soon as he pulled it out, I thought that's good turkey. Yeah. <laughs> so they had like the taste test, and everyone yeah. thought the Oscar Mayer because <laughs> of it's it's so juicy. It's so juicy. it is so juicy. It's You're so like juicy. I don't know what they did to this bird, <laughs> but it tastes good. But it tastes the so only good. the only Thanksgiving oh, yeah. bird that has been exceptional. Was one year I had an individual fry a turkey and then infuse it with wing sauce. So it was like wings. It tasted like wings. It what? was like the buffalo wing. You know so what I mean? So basically you had sauce. a turkey that looked like a chicken wing. That was fried. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That was the best turkey I've ever had. Unbelievable. I know, man. Hey, you know, we talk about Do Perfect now because I can make a whole episode about Do Perfect. Can you believe one of the dudes went to space? I heard that. I have not. I, it was I a have, great episode. I've not caught up on Dude Perfect, oh, but I heard that I, they went. Yeah, we watch it religiously in my house. Dude to Perfect. space. <laughs> he went to space. Oh, my gosh. So here, okay, here's my Dude Perfect story. Yeah. If you don't know what Dude Perfect is, it's five college buddies. From Texas A&M. From Texas A&M that got their, got their show going by doing just trick shots. On just YouTube. Ridiculous shots on YouTube. And now it's like this multi-million dollar business that has built their empire. Yeah. Christian dudes. Christian dudes. Jay and I went down and saw them live yeah. with our kids. And then they gave the gospel message at the Pepsi Center. At the end of the show. They're like, hey, just so you know, like it's great being on YouTube for all of our supporters. Thanks. But the best thing is knowing Jesus Christ as your <laughs> Lord and Savior. This is, like, <laughs> this is how you do it. You know? Yeah. I was like, that was great for all my kids to yeah. watch these yahoos who do silly things. Just say the best thing about life is knowing Jesus Christ. Right. Anyway, my mom has never <laughs> seen Dude Perfect. Yeah. So the boys are at her house, and they say, can we watch Dude Perfect? And she says, yes. Yeah. So they pull up an episode. Yeah. And it's one of those episodes where they've, like, put together a series of balls falling right. sequentially that ends up making a shot. Yeah. So my mom tells me that they've watched this really great show on engineering. <laughs> <laughs> She says, hey, whatever that, th those boys were really lovely. Yeah. And they're like engineers about like how they build stuff. And I was like, what did you watch <laughs> with the kids? So she's describing this show on engineering. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, you mean Dude Perfect? She's like, yeah, that's what it's called. I was like, that's not a show on engineering. <laughs> but Okay, well, thanks. Yes, it's a STEM program. Yeah. <laughs> So good. Anyway, God bless him. Yeah, man. My, anyways, do perfect. You made the reference. Okay, so we're, it's Thanksgiving week, but we're also finishing out pausing. Actually, pausing the Luke series. Good news to all people, and just, we're gonna pick that up in 2023, January of 2023. So don't worry, we're not finished yet. But we're gonna now institute Christmas. Christmas is here. I can hear the sleigh bells in the background. No. Somewhere. No. Yes. I still have to get through Turkey Day. I I need the snow to melt so that I can put up my Christmas lights. This is true. There is a window to do that. It'll yeah. be this week. It'll be this week. But uh yes, it is 
Christmas is here at Calvary. You can go to calvarybible.com to find out what's happening in your neck of the woods. Click your campus. Click what's events. And there's so many great things happening here at Calvary. Also, you can go to calvarybible.com. And here's the thing. Backslash Christmas. You can get to your campus's Christmas events as well as we have an Advent reading guide this year for you and your family. We have one for your family and then one for the adults as well. They're the same on Sunday, so you're not reading two Advent guides. But the adults have readings all week long that you can journey with us here at Calvary. Just make Christmas what? Christ-centered. That's right. That's what we're trying to do here. Hey, you so, know, I, I'm so thankful for the Advent guides, yeah. seriously, because in all the hecticness and all the busyness, it's so easy to get Jesus to be second seat, yeah. back seat, no not doubt. paying attention, and then arrive Christmas Eve and try to like bring all that spiritual awareness in 30 minutes. Right. It's just not possible. Right. So living in that awareness for the next 25 days? Yeah, there's um, 29 days. 29 days? Between November 27th, which starts, kicks off the Advent reading, into December 25th. There is a reading on Christmas Day. Great. Yeah. Cool. So, you know, one of the things here for me is people, you know, I get occasionally asked, why are we doing Advent? Isn't that a Catholic thing? Simply, Advent means arrival. It's a Latin word for arrival. And we are participating between two arrivals. The first arrival of Jesus, when he came, put on flesh, dwelt among us. That's John 1, people. And the second arrival, where he comes again. And Christmas is actually this reality that something future is going to happen. We're not just looking at the past. We look at the past to see what the future looks like. Does that make sense, Thomas, to you? Yeah. And so... Evans is a great marker for us at Calvary because let me let me say something in recorded history. Christmas season is some of the most un-Christian season for Jay Ewing because it's full of things I have to do. Does that make sense? No. It's the less <laughs> Christ-centered season. One of the most un-Christ-centered seasons in my life. You know, I think that goes back to, you know, we were it been in Luke. And Jesus continues to warn about wealth yeah. and how it can take an inappropriate, it can occupy an inappropriate place in your life, right. which actually puts the believer in probably the most dangerous spiritual place of forgetting the Lord. Mm-hmm. And I think that's just, that is Christmas, is it? Yeah. I mean, I think it's Thanksgiving too, yeah. in some sense, totally. of, of all the things that we're blessed by that can then take up residency as our main affections. Right. And it's just, it, it's just to say, hey, that's why we do these practices mm-hmm. of being in the word daily. This is why we have these practices of Advent reading. This is why we recenter ourselves on Sunday is because we don't want to drift mm-hmm. and that's get right. caught up in things that just are of such less value. That's right. That's right. And so an Advent reading guide and this year I put together a new one, a unique one. So it's not the typical Christmas readings. We're going to read from Isaiah and John's writings because each week in Isaiah on church, there's some themes that pop out to us. Light, shepherd. What are some other, the other two from Isaiah that as you prep? Uh, he is the bread that satisfies. Right. Yeah. yeah. There's some themes. And so John is really good about explaining those things. And I felt like, you know, this year we should get into John and not miss out some of the things that he, some of the metaphors he has for us with these themes in Isaiah. Does that make sense? Yeah, it'd be fun to be going through the Christmas season through Isaiah. Um, sometimes Isaiah is referred to as the fifth gospel. I love referring it to the fifth gospel. The witness of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. So mm-hmm. I think it'll be great to look at what was promised, mm-hmm. what has been fulfilled, and how does that excite our hearts for what is coming. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I think so. And, you know, I, I said in the Advent Guide, John and Isaiah have a lot more in common than you think they do. Um, one of the things is they love to use metaphors. They love word Im- word pictures to help explain big realities of God. I I love that about them too. I like I think it just you know 
how simple is it to say in God's, I'm the light. Everyone knows what light is, right? We've all been in a dark room and turned on light. We know what those two things, darkness and light. Those are the simplest themes in human civilization, but yet they're some of the richest themes about who God is. Does that make sense? You know, I think it is wonderful about that is if, if you gave a modern evangelical theologian the opportunity to have been a disciple of Jesus, they would have given us, given us volumes of trying to define everything with words mm -hmm. so that we would have no more questions, but it would take libraries. Mm -hmm. And then you have the Apostle John. It's like, I'm going to give you a word picture. <laughs> yeah. And then just to let your imagination, you know, right. Holy Spirit-filled, biblically informed imagination, meditate on what does it look like to have light in my life? Yeah. Where do I like life? Or do I, where do I want light in my life? Totally. What's it like in darkness? How do I feel in darkness? What am I trying to conceal in darkness? What does light bring? You know, just so many, so many great things. And then he has this metaphor that sticks, right? Like that in your own life. And then you read the Old Testament, you're like, there's a lot of light in the Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> really important passages of light. So you want to be biblically astute as well. Yeah. It's like amazing, right? How John does that. I can't remember what the number is. It's something just ridiculous. Like Jonathan Edwards had preached, I don't know, 50, 100 sermons about the light of a candle. Mm -hmm. wow. Just because of all of the references and ideas of what it is that God is light. Wow. I think he lit a candle and preached and let people just focus on the light. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is amazing. But we, we want to do justice. Also, we're pausing Luke, and we were in Luke 14 this last week. And... Does this just feel like from Luke 11 to 14 are some of the hardest teachings of Jesus? I think, going back to what we've discussed before, I think they're clarifying. They're very clarifying. You know? He's telling us the truth. Yeah. And I think that's where, again, I just am so thankful for him. He's not smoke and mirrors. He's not a marketing machine. He is not trying to bait and switch people. He is doing his compassion ministries, and he gives great teachings, which attract the crowds. And then he authenticates it usually with a miracle and then gives a clarifying teaching of who he is, what it means to follow him, who can follow him, who's in danger of falling away from him. I don't know. I just find it, it's convicting. I yeah. mean, I've been super convicted. Yeah. That but is, this week in Luke 14, we encounter a man on the Sabbath who has dropsy. Yeah. What is dropsy? Well, I'm no medical expert, but the things I read, yeah. essentially the assumption is this man has a condition where the body swells with excess fluids, mm. which put his heart and liver in a dangerous position to have maybe even cardiac arrest. That's a crazy disease to have, to live yeah. with. Yeah. And Jesus heals him on the Sabbath. Again, so this is another Sabbath healing. This one's unique. It seems to be because the Pharisees have done this perhaps as a setup plan. Mm -hmm. So from Luke 11, we know the Pharisees are now trying to trap him yeah so, so th that they've invited him to their house and they're like we should ride the guy with drop scene and yeah. see if jesus see, will see what he does yeah and we can catch him really that's unique it's very unique that that is that is one you know yeah. uh, reading into it and I, I think i agree with it because jesus is keen to their plan mm -hmm. like why is this man placed here i mean before it was like why does jesus eat with these people why does he eat with sinners um you know prostitutes tax collectors people who are outcasts, the poor, the lame, the crippled. So they wouldn't normally have someone maybe mm -hmm. at their dinner party. Maybe perhaps it's the poor around the outside um, courtyard waiting for scraps. It could be that. Yeah. Um, but perhaps it's a, a placement and Jesus just turns it back on them and says, do you think it's lawful to mm. be compassionate and merciful on the Sabbath? And they don't say anything, which I think is to them like, oh man, we've been convicted. Right. We've been found out. Right. And then he tells this parable of a wedding feast. Now, this is a unique thing because they're not, wedding feasts aren't like what we experience when we go to a wedding these days, right? No. We don't get a save the date with this great calligraphy. Well, you, I mean, you got, your, you got your original invitation. Okay. So we kind of talked about you get two invitations to a banquet back then. Okay. Because it takes a long time to prepare. You can't just go to Costco on Friday and, and throw the banquet on Saturday. So you have to go hunt animals. Well, you can't go to Costco. 
between here and Christmas anyway. Oh, man, I was, I was <laughs> that's there. The, that's the worst time. The to other go day, <laughs> just to go get the last things of the shopping list because yeah. I didn't want to be there this week. And I saw this lady asking a manager, do you have any more turkeys? And he said, no. And then it's another person, do you have any more eggs? And they said, no. And I thought, hmm, you're about a week late. <laughs> <laughs> if well, I had a turkey in my car, I would have given it because yeah. – I'd be happy to give away my turkey. Yeah, I'll go get steaks. We'll go get a prime rib. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, so he sends out. He has to pay, it's, it's a, it's a anyway, so several month process. Yeah, so first invitation goes out like, hey, we're going to have a banquet. Do you want to RSVP yes or no? So they RSVP yes. And then when everything's been procured and it's ready, the next invitation goes out. It's ready. It's time. But like in between those two invitations, you have to harvest food. Yes, the master of the banquet has to harvest everything. You have to go and make sure you can get enough wine from the distributor in town. Yeah, or make it. Or make it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, totally. It takes months to prepare for this. Right. And st- strategy. Like, it's not just up. Yeah. Yeah. So, I think there's another picture of what heaven is like. So, all of our poor imagery of clouds and blue skies and nothingness is ridiculous the, the scriptures are so filled with rich imagery yeah from old testament all the way to revelation of what it looks like to be in the presence of god mm-hmm. one of them being a multi-day festival mm-hmm. with appetite and festivities and fun and relationship and music and dancing and wine and choice meats yeah. and the enjoyment of one another and jesus has to leave earth to go prepare for that yeah that's crazy He's preparing, yeah. He's preparing. He had to leave earth because he had to prepare for heaven. He had to prepare us for heaven. He had to prepare heaven for us. It's How great. do you say it? Yeah. Yeah. He's preparing a place for us. So anyway, that he tells that story, yeah. Yeah. Of a banquet. And so between, so basically he says, hey, there's guests that RSVP'd yes initially that now the banquet's ready are making excuses. Mm-hmm. They can't be there. And Man, I think about that with our own culture. Let me just go off on like a, a hobby horse right now and just yeah. rant for a minute. How uncommittal are people these days? Yeah, totally. And I like I'm convicted too, right? About this, but like, how many times have have I sent out something and someone says yes initially, and then like just a better op- opportunity comes up and they're like, oh man, I can't be there anymore. Yeah, totally. Just it's like FOMO. Okay, do you have FOMO or JOMO? What's JOMO? <laughs> so FOMO is fear of missing out. Yeah. So if your buddies all got like an invite to a wedding or a sporting event mm-hmm. and you didn't go, that'd be FOMO. Like, I just, I, I can't miss this. Yeah, duh. JOMO is you found out that you didn't get invited and you have joy of missing out. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, oh, sweet. That's awesome. I can stay at my house. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have to drive down to Denver. I can watch it from my TV. Yeah. Do you think you have FOMO or JOMO? I don't know. It's really de- ridiculous, Thomas. <laughs> so they, they're they uncommittal. They can, they bail out. He's They he's bail out because cause. something has captured their attention and their heart between the first and second invitation. Yeah. That's what's happened. Is between saying yes and then attending to the banquet mm. or attending the banquet, something else has come into their life that they find more interesting. Yeah, they find more interesting, so they make lame excuses. Man, lame excuses. L- so, l- lame property, excuses. which we, we said was the prospects of future investments. Mm-hmm. You have oxen, and that's possessions, new things you got to check out and play with. Yeah. And then marriage, like I think I equate that to passions, mm-hmm. it's relationships. Like these are just more important than attending the master's banquet. Yeah. And Jesus tells his parable with the Pharisees right after he healed a man. Yeah. Like to the Pharisees, the religious leaders who are striving for righteousness so that they will be in the kingdom. Yeah. Like that's why they're doing everything. It's not, see, they're not trying to do these good works to earn the kingdom. No. They know that they went into exile because they lacked faithfulness to God. Mm-hmm. And so their solution is we must remain spiritually holy and pure. So that exile one won't happen again. And the kingdom promises will come because we will be a holy enough people for the kingdom to arrive. So I think they're striving after good things. Yeah, and they're just totally missing the man who's brought, bringing the kingdom. Yeah, like, <laughs> but I'm not coming through Jesus. Yeah, totally. He's like, I'm the servant to tell you that the banquet's ready. Yeah, and you're missing out. You're missing Which out. I, I'm, I mean, there are plenty of texts that talk about 
heaven and hell and judgment. You know, this one to me is just, I don't know, it's disturbing because I'm the one that excuses myself. So these these three groups say, please consider myself excused Mm. to the master. And he doesn't get enraged and demand their presence. He's enraged that he's been declined and goes and fills his house house with other willing parts participants. Yeah. Then he says to all those who ask to be excused, you may be excused. Yeah, totally. It's sort of like C.S. Lewis writing with the great divorce is when we come to find out that people actually don't want to be in heaven. Yeah. I think, I think in so many of my, so many times in my life, I think, well, everyone wants to be there. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, I've had too many conversations now. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, they, they want to be excused. They want to be excused. And yeah. the Lord, the master of the house will let them be excused. I, just, I mean, like, don't, if you're listening today, don't excuse yourself. Like, you're never going to, you're never going to be in heaven wishing, oh, man, I really wish I would have, wish I had my oxen back. Yeah, totally. I don't know. Yeah, it's so, true. It's very anyway, true, man. Convicting for me what, what things occupy my attention more than responding to the invitation of Jesus. And I think we're in that season again, like, so many blessings, mm-hmm. you know, so many blessings. And I think, I don't know, there, there's a way, I think there's a posture to go into even this week and into the season of Advent that I, I would encourage us all to do. We talked about it before of just gratitude. I think we live in a, a day and age when so many industries are teaching us to be unthankful mm-hmm. and to be unsatisfied and be angry about how things are. That's if they do that, you buy their stuff. Yeah. They, this, that's what happens. Yeah, be unsatisfied by this. Yeah. Right? Or join me or, yeah. you know, whatever it is. And and I think that this this comes from an article that was sent to me this week, which I was, I was thankful to read. I guess it was two weeks ago. Of, I don't want to feel guilty for the Lord's blessings in my life. You know, some people might call that privilege. Mm-hmm. You have a mom and dad. You have two parents or you're healthy. Yeah. People want to, you, you know, you're just so privileged. It is true, I am. I don't know if, if the godly response is guilt mm-hmm. and to feel shame over those things, but to have two responses of gratitude and generosity. So if the Lord has blessed me with these things, then how do I just say thank you? Mm-hmm. Gratitude and generosity. Yeah, and then say, how, how can I share? Mm-hmm. And I think those are, that's the Christian posture to this season, is anything you touch, experience, see, enjoy, be quick to say, Thanks be to God. Mm-hmm. Thank you, God, that this moment that we have, I'm living in a golden moment right now. It seems like everybody in the family is getting along, you know, mm-hmm. or I have these people around the table this year. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then, man, who can I share this with? Like, who, how does the world benefit from me possessing these things? That's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. But so, okay, I don't want to go without talking about this. Is Luke 14 probably the maybe the hardest paragraph of the whole Gospel of Luke? Luke 14, 25 through 33, maybe 34. Yeah, Zach Thompson, Pastor Zach, preached on this text in Thornton. So take a listen. So take a listen. (laughs) Yeah, take a listen to Zach. I would actually encourage you, if you you really want to know more about it, go to 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 calvarybible.com, click on current series, and click on Luke 14 from Zach's this week. But he's unpacking the cost of discipleship. And it's real. It's real. There is a cost... You know, I'm always haunted by grace is free, but discipleship costs. Bonhoeffer. Yeah. That's a big statement that always rings around Luke 14. You know what I mean? Like that the kingdom of God, there is an invitation and it's free. It's a, it's a gift. But there's also a cost that you have to have in order to attend. Yeah. I do think Luke is putting that teaching, because it's not in the immediate context, but I think he's putting that teaching there to parallel the three excuses. Mm -hmm. So Jesus saying, hey, invitation's open. Mm -hmm. Like, come to the kingdom. Those who are lame, poor, have nothing, cannot repay, in the city, outside the city, Jew, Gentile. You're all welcome. You're all welcome. But there is a cost. Like, you're going to have to leave. You have to leave something to come to the banquet. Mm -hmm. And so I think his, his teaching there is to say, look at the people that did not leave possessions, passions behind to pursue Christ. Like you have to do that. Um, Christ has to be supreme in those things. Um, and I think that's the point in that. But I, I always go back to, here's the deal. 
it's going to, no matter what your decision is, it always costs you something. Mm -hmm. Whenever I say yes to something, I'm saying no to something else, right? Always. So if I'm saying yes to more and more promotions at work, I'm probably saying no to more and more family engagements. Totally. In the sense of like more time commitments, not always promotions. I shouldn't equate the two. But if I have to continually give more time and best energies and creativity to work, that means I'm giving less best energies, creativity, and time to family. Right. That's just an exa- one example. It's just a cost. Yeah. Just- so it's like I'm saying yes to one thing, and it's a cost to another thing. Right. I could also say, hey, I'm going to say more yes to family time and no to certain activities I'm invited to or opportunities or vacations with buddies, you know, mm-hmm. because I'm saying no to something. So, yeah, it's cost. You have to count the cost to follow Jesus. But the people who said no to Jesus for their land, oxen, and marriage as well, they missed out on something. They missed out on something. So it's going to cost you something no matter what. Mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to just count. I think that's why I said count it. Because at the end of the day, I'm, you know, an adult now with kids. And some of those things I was really passionate about when I was 12. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm not as passionate about anymore. Totally. Some things I was passionate about in my 20s, I'm not passionate about yeah. anymore. And it's like, man, if I would have lost relationships with Jesus over those things, mm-hmm. I'd feel so foolish. But right now, I'm so occupied with my current passions yeah. and possessions, you know. Totally. And it's like, you know, when I get to 50, 60, I'll look back and go, what was I? What was I so spun up about? Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. And Luke finishes, and Jesus finishes. I should say even more. This whole scene with a phrase that I find is one of the hardest phrases to hear, and that is, "He who has ears to hear, let him hear." That's a that's an interesting phrase. Isn't it? Yeah. He says it quite often, actually. Jesus says that phrase quite often. He who has the ears to hear, let him hear. And so maybe that's the challenge for us, even in this season, is do we have our ears tuned to hearing that voice from the Lord? All right. Thomas has nothing to say. <laughs> I was listening. <laughs> no, man. <laughs> no, listening. It's good to know. It's a, it's, it's a crazy phrase. I think, yeah, it's, it's the wake up, pay attention. Do you have... Are you in tune with what's really going on? Mm -hmm. Totally. And do you have ears to hear? And I think that is, I mean, if there's any, here's, I would say this. If there's any movement in your life, incentive to listen, don't ignore it. Mm -hmm. Because there's no guarantee you have any interest in listening tomorrow. Mm. And so it's like, if you have ears to hear, just even the smallest sense of the Father's voice to say, come to me, or read this text with your family, or say a prayer of gratitude. Or pray with your wife. Or pray with your wife. I mean, whatever it is, if, yeah. you, if you are moved in any way, don't ignore it. Because mm-hmm. there's no guarantee that you're going to be moved to follow tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So good. All right, Calvary, we just love you. We're praying for you in this season. We're so thankful for you. So grateful for your commitment to us. Thanks for always listening as well. We hope you have a great beginning of the holiday season. Kicking off with Thanksgiving. Ending in Christmas or beginning in Christmas. Anyways, we love you. <laughs> All right, have a great Thanksgiving. We'll see you this Sunday in Isaiah. <laughs> yeah, we will. Yeah. Kicking off Christmas season. I love it. Light a first candle. Light the first candle. <laughs>